All right. Uh, well, it is 11 o'clock Eastern now, so we'll probably get started. Uh, so Lord right. Scoopy uh, is uh, one of the officers of uh, uh, GII, Garden Interstellar Initiative, uh, where a bunch of us uh, came over from, so that's how we know him. Uh, and he's a good friend, but he also uh, is one of the founders of Verscad, which is a tool a lot of us use for exploration. Uh, so we asked Lord Skippy to come uh, talk to us today uh, and kind of put together a little seminar for us. Maybe he'll tell us a little bit about himself as well. Uh, and uh, I'll be quiet here and let you get started. Hi, hi. I hope you can hear me all right. If not, uh, shout at Fika and Chica will shout at me because I can't see anything that you're typing in the chat. Um, I'm Lord Skippy. I did prepare a little bit about myself, uh, so a few questions I can answer. There's no discussion about the correctness of the answer. Star Wars or Star Trek? The answer would be brown coat, obviously. Um, and that's Wash from Firefly next to me. I met him in Orlando just a couple of weeks ago. It was absolutely amazing. Um, Draco Crusader? The answer is obviously Carrick, um, but only because it can hold a Pisces best ship in the Pardon world. Pardon me, Skippy. Uh, we can uh, only see your webcam right now if you're trying to share screen oh, as well. I am. Wait. Here we go. That's much better. That's Wash. Wash in Orlando. Firefly. Best guy ever. Super nice dude. Um, Carrick is home. So uh, best ship in the world is the Pisces. And that's why I'm flying the Carrick, because it can carry on. And if anyone is wondering why I'm Lord Skippy a kangaroo, I'm not. I'm a beer can. And I hope someone gets a reference. In real life, I'm working under a NASA contract out of the University of Florida, and we are building a multi-billion dollar space mission that will hopefully detect colliding black holes at the edge of the observable universe. So that's our big goal. Launch date is 2035. Um, I'm working on that mission for almost 20 years, so it's a long project, it's an expensive project, but if it works out in the end, it will be very, very gratifying. So if anyone has any questions about gravitational wave, astrophysics, and cosmology, please let me know as well. And then where to find me, if you have any questions uh, are too shy to ask, or if you come up with a question way after the fact. Um, I am on YouTube, The Lord Skippy. I'm on Twitter, The Lord Skippy. I'm here on Discord, obviously, just shoot me a DM and ping cheeker if i'm not responding because i didn't see it um also i'm on tiktok uh, i have like two videos up there and i have no idea how to chat on tiktok so this might be a futile attempt if you try try that but about today's topic so uh, i asked cheeker what you were looking for he gave me like a quick outline of of topics i should talk about um that would be the origin story uh, of verse guide then how verse guide is collecting data we do data mining um, then a quick demo how to use verse guide most efficiently uh, how you can contribute and there are a couple of ways you can contribute to verse guide and then about the bleak future foreshadowing of verse guide uh, how we are trying to continue uh, and then if you have any questions you can ask anytime uh, again in chat and chica will interrupt me hopefully uh, as or we'll feel free to this. raise your hand and we'll open up your oh. voice so you could come up on stage with Skippy. So yeah, just feel free to interrupt me. Maybe it's easier in the flow of the, the discussion. In the end, we will do a Q&A if there are any questions left over. All right. Uh, the origins of Verse Guide. These are the original gangsters. Uh, I had a team of four people who were super interested in how to find locations in the version that's like three years ago, 313, I think, something like that. Um, so we had Stoic Mako, Fanny, and Bearded Nugget, and myself, and we all had different real life skills we were bringing into the project. It was a, a super fun time to build things up. But by now, the project has grown and we have a lot of contributors. So we use a lot of third party projects trying to integrate them. So there's Pandabot, Graupong, Just Murphy, Captain Shepard, Mincake, Pitapa, Scarecrow, Mipovsky, uh, Xab. We have Bofone, Captain BA, and many others uh, joining every day. And I'm pretty sure I forgot many to mention. So it's a, it's a big team by now, although we are moving, unfortunately, quite slow because everyone has like real life work to do as well. 
So where are we coming from? What what was the original goal? I started in Star Citizen in Nova Intergalactic, the organization. And they had an exploration wing that was using distances to orbital markers to find locations on a planet. And they did a little, little game like here. These are the OM distances to a certain spot. Can you find it? And then you were flying down to the surface and try to align yourself with the distance of this OM. But then the other distance didn't match. And then you were trying the other way around. And it was was quite a challenge to to find location that way. And we were wondering how many OM distances you actually need to find a spot. If you need all six distances or if three distances are enough. And if there's a more methodical way to, to find a location instead of like trying to go in circles on the surface of a planet and check the distance to all six OMs all the time and then give up after three hours. Um, there must be a mathematical solution, which is the optimal, optimal flight path to that location. And how could you, you do that? And we were all nerds and interested in, in mathematics and geometry and trying to, to solve that riddle, like basically playing Star Citizen on spreadsheets and uh, MATLAB and whatnot. So let's get into the nerdy math for, for a bit. If you have the distance to a single orbital marker, then here on the right hand side, you see OM6. There's a distance 84.4 kilometers. I'm not sure if the, the text is large enough to read that. The blue thing is the planet itself. And if you have this distance, then you can be sure that the location you're looking for is somewhere on the surface of a sphere with a radius of 84.4 kilometers. But obviously the location you're looking for is on the planet and not somewhere deep in space. So you're looking for a location that is on the intersection of the surface of the sphere around the orbital marker and the surface of the planet. So that would be a ring on the surface of the planet. So your location you're looking for is somewhere on that ring. That's all right, pretty good. If you only have one distance to one orbital marker, you can be sure you're somewhere on this ring on this planet. If you have a second orbital marker, you need to look at the intersection between the two surfaces of the two spheres based on the radii of the two distances to these orbital markers. So we have a second uh, distance, OM3 should be 124.2 kilometers away. So you get an intersection between the two surfaces of the spheres, which will be a ring. But then again, you're not somewhere in space. You're most likely somewhere on the surface of the planet. So you're looking at the intersection between the ring and the planetary surface. And these are just two points at this point. So two orbital marker distances, given those orbital markers on different axes. That's very important. So it can't be on the same axis. Um, but if you have them on different axes, then you get two points on the surface of a planet where your location you're looking for could be. Still not enough because you can fly to one and then there's nothing there and then you're frustrated and all the four. Um, so we need a third orbital marker. And if you do that, you get again, a intersection between the surface of a sphere with a radius of the third distance of this orbital marker intersecting with the ring you had before. And this now gives you two points again. And then you need to compare the two points with the surface of your planet. And you will most likely find out that one of these points is deep underground. And hopefully you're not looking for that because you will crash into the surface uh, trying to find it. And the other one most of the time is a few meters above ground. And that's the one you're looking for. So if you have three orbital markers plus an altitude, you can determine with certainty the location you're looking for. So that's all we need. Three orbital markers to get the two points and then the altitude from the planetary surface. And if the altitude is not minus five kilometers, but like plus 200 meters, you know, okay, that's the one. Excuse so, me, we have a question, if you don't mind me calling someone up to speak. Yes, please. All right, Middle okay. Nickel, what do you, what's on your mind, sir? I, yeah, so I was, maybe I didn't quite get the explanation quite clearly, but why couldn't you use uh, 
two OMs on the same access point. Because it, it, and my thought was if, you know, the two distances are, or I guess if you're at one point in between the two and the distance is the, you know, what you're looking for between them, wouldn't that be relatively accurate? Okay, let me let me try to reiterate the question. You were asking why the distances to two OMs can't be on the same axis. Right. Like if um, you know it's like if you know it's going to be on the side of OM six, why couldn't you just use the opposite side and go towards the planet? And once you get to that OM distance between the two, like. It, oh. Same way, same way with mm. this, but just instead you're kind of in between the two. That only works if the location is along this axis, and then it would be perfect. If... Okay, so, but you could still do it like within that ring, but along that axis. So if I have two, let me try to find a illustration that might work a little bit. So if I have OM6. And the other end of the same axis would be OM5. I would get two spheres. And I would be looking for a point that might be here, for example. I would have a distance from OM5 to this point that would create a sphere with a surface that intersects the planet at exactly the same ring. It would oh, be a larger, okay. larger surface, larger sphere, but the intersection between that larger sphere and the planet would be exactly the same. So, because all points on this ring have the same distance to OM6 and the same distance to OM5. Okay, I, I just couldn't quite visually see it. Like... Mm, it, is, <laughs> it is horrible to imagine what's going on because three dimensions and whatnot, it's all easy in 2D. In 3D is like no, so you, you need need three dimensional uh, three hmm, or orthogonal axes so that the information is independent in all three dimensions. If you have distances on the same axes, so two OMs on the same axes, you get information that is redundant, and you don't learn anything about the Y and. Uh, Z direction, so you still only have information about the X axis, and you need all three axes. So, okay, three OMs on orthogonal axes, either OM1 or 2, and then either 3 or 4, or either 5 or 6. One of each, three in total, plus altitude gives you a perfect spot, a single individual spot on the surface or above or slightly below the surface of a planet. And now the big question is, is there a better way to find back to that location instead of like trying to align the, the OM distances? Uh, because for aligning OM distances, having the distance to all six OMs is much easier because it's hard to find the one, like the three OMs that were given to you. If you have all six OM distances, it's easier to find distances and the like, like distant readouts and you can line yourself manually but to get a unique solution three are enough um so question is how to find back and that's why i brought an orange is that the one i want orange here i hope you can see that i brought a pen no oh, oh, there clearly. Work. does it work it works great. We can see it very well. Nice. Nice. Okay. So, my orange is a planet. My... Lost my scissors. Orange is my planet. The... Sticks are the axes, and at the end of the sticks there are the OMs. I have quantum beacons at the OM, so I can fly there directly. That's my starting point. And I want to reach a point on the planet, X marks the spot. So that's where, ha, that's where I want to go. So how do I do that? 
in the most efficient way possible to me within the constraints of Star Citizen. Because obviously it would be easy if I... Not sharp. Hello. Focus. <laughs> if I start here and fly directly to the point, that would be great, but I don't know the angle I need to align my ship at. But what I can do is I find the closest OM to the spot, which would be this one. And then I fly in the direction of the second closest OM, because that's another quantum beacon I have to my advantage. So there's a straight line. I did not try if that works. If the tape is hold strong enough. Ugh. Here we go. Oh, this is, this is stupid. <laughs> OK. <laughs> so I start at the closest OM. And I fly along, it tries to focus on my face there. It tries, uh, I will try to fly along the direct path between the second closest OM. So that I am at a point at a minimum distance to the location I'm trying to go. So I'm flying in this direction towards the OM and stop at a certain distance. And I can calculate this distance with like trigonometry. How many kilometers do I have to fly? How far away would this OM be? So that I'm at a minimum distance to the location where I want to go to. That's where I stop. And then I stop and point my ship into the direction of the third closest OM. Need to do that off camera. That's it. Here we go. Nice. Uh -oh. That works. So I was flying from here to the point that's closest along this line. And now I'm flying towards the third closest OM in this direction. And I, again, with trigonometry, can calculate the point where I'm right above the location I want to go. Since this point here along this line was the point closest to the location, I can be sure that the straight line from that point to the third OM will go directly above the location I want to go to. Again, I can calculate how far the third OM would be away at this point in space. So I stop at, I don't know, 500 kilometers distance, point my ship straight down to the surface of the planet and go down and hopefully stop before I hit the ground. And then I should be in theory, straight above the location I'm trying to find. And that's some complex trigonometry, but easy enough for computers to do. So we came up with algorithms that uh, were giving us the distances to the OMs and the passes we have to take. And that's how these, oh, wait, I'm share, not sharing my screen. Here we go. That's how these plots come to be. I start at OM5, go in the direction of OM3, but I stop like a quarter of the way, go towards OM, uh, OM1, which is the third closest OM, stop at just a few kilometers, and then I go straight down to the surface of the planet. And that is what we were building under the brand Nova Navigator. Again, I was in Nova Intergalactic, and we were trying to find better ways to find locations more easily and faster. And we came up with an interface where you can either put in the distance to OMs, but you could also uh, have geo coordinates like latitude, longitude, altitude, or X, Y, Z coordinates. And it was like converting one to the other. They're all interchangeable could select the, the planet, the planet radius, and the distance to uh, from the planet core to orbital markers is important for that. And then it was giving you flight instructions. Start at this OM, check that the center is actually the distance we assume it should be, and then fly towards OM5 and stop at the distance, and so on and so forth. And then at the end, you have arrived. And then we had a bad breakup. Um, we started data mining, meaning we decrypted the game files of Star Citizen trying to see if our locations we are finding 
correspond to locations that are in the game files, trying to figure out if anything hidden is there. Um, and that was a very cool project. We, we started to upload the website, so it is available to other organizations as well. So the Nova Navigator brand, but available to everyone, not behind a like, login just for members. And that was all not sitting fine with the leaders of Nova. Although they were using data mining themselves for a trade calculator, data mining the prices of, of different commodities from different terminals to maximize the profit for different trade routes. Um, they told us that data mining is an absolute no-go, which was like double standard and weird. And then they also wanted to have this navigator only for themselves behind members only login and not available for the public. So they have an advantage and we were like, no, no. Like many of the um, methods we implemented came from outside Nova. It was not from members, but from other community members of Star Citizen from different organizations helping us get this mass done and implement everything on the website. Like we, we can't take their help and then put it behind a paywall basically. So Nova kicked us out and that was a pretty good thing in the end because then we were really looking into data mining and basically building Verse Guide 1.0 as you know it today. A little bit details about data mining. Um, it's, it's a controversial topic. Currently, Star Citizen, Persistent Universe, you download the, I don't know, 80 gigabytes worth of game files and there are open source tools, Unforge and Unpack, um, that allow you to decrypt and unpack the game files and look basically at the, not at the source code, but at many of the metadata and uh, database files of Star Citizen. And although persistent entity streaming is now a thing, and if you crash your ship somewhere and come back, or like if you drop your, your um, uh, coffee up in the forest and you come back two years later, it's still there, that's not in the game files. No one is recompiling the game and make people download another 80 gigabytes worth of files just so that your coffee cup that you dropped two years ago is now still in the game files. That's not how it works. Um, the coffee cup will be streamed from the servers to your client. So that's online only. You can't see it in the game files. However, all persistent locations, including trade terminals and all buildings in all cities and all outposts and all items that are permanently in these outposts that are not randomly appearing and disappearing like loot boxes, for example, all persistent items are hard coded in the game files you download, meaning that you can basically reconstruct entire cities if you look into the game files with all buildings, with all doors, with every single detail. Um, and obviously, the game files hold the locations of these objects. So if you look into the game files, decrypt them, look at the metadata, you can find out where each output is, where all the caves are. Um, and that is something we are doing. So we use these open source tools. And CIG is trying to, I'm not sure if they're actively trying to make it harder and more challenging. It's actually fun to, to figure out what CIG changes from version to version. Um, the location of the files that holds the locations to locations in, in the verse. I said locations way too many times. Um, change. Uh, folders for example so suddenly everything is gone you're like oh did they finally move everything server side oh no they just changed folders um that's how how folder looks like at the moment for a certain uh, for locations on hurston you have the caves and derelicts and uh, shanty towns and whatnot and different subfolders and then you can look at the um, xml files and you see internal uuid numbers for this is a derelict uh, for constellation which is crashed it's a second one that's why the b is there and you get some some identifiers and down here you have a position in cartesian x y and z coordinates in meters in the planetary reference frame and then you can convert that to latitude longitude altitude or to om distances if you know the distances to the orbital markers so you can find all of this in the game files currently we hope that at some point CAG will move all of this to the service. So it's not part of the game files anymore. And that would 
enable true exploration without basically cheating like this. Um, we don't consider this cheating at this point because in-game tools don't allow you to do anything with the knowledge of locations. Um, doesn't give you a big advantage, but having a database like Verse Guide or many others that are out there is enabling gameplay. Like you can find these locations, you can go there, you can do machine in mind, screenshots and whatnot. So currently we think of ourselves as we are enabling gameplay, but the moment we think that we are hindering gameplay or actually spoiling or um, giving people an unfair advantage or uh, uh, suppressing in-game mechanics, uh, we would consider not data mining anymore. And at some point we hope data mining will not be possible anymore. But, but yeah, we, can... we have a question from uh, Esmer T. I just called him up. All right. Hi. Hey there. I was just uh, one really impressed uh, with all the stuff you done with Risk Guide and uh, like to help out more. But I'm curious with all your sort of data mining abilities, if you've managed to find a way to extract like terrain elevation data in a way that could be sort of useful in like Google Earth or ArcGIS or something like that. Yes, uh, not we. Uh, again, the, the original crew is long been overshadowed by many other brilliant minds in the community. Um, Captain BA wrote a script that was able to basically reverse engineer Planet Tech. So they found the location in the game file that tells elevation data, terrain data, and um, obviously it's if you would try to get the elevation data for an entire planet in the game files, the game file would be much, much larger. So uh, it's all uh, uh, the planet tech is using tricks to make the game files small, but that hinders you to read out elevation data directly. But Captain BA found the algorithms to reconstruct planetary terrain based on the compressed data set um, that CIG is using in the game files. So yes, we get elevation data and terrain information out of the game files now, but with we, I don't mean Verse Guide, but other members of the community that were helping us getting this data into uh, Verse Guide as well. You know, I, there's I, a way we can uh, access that? It broke. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's, uh, that's the thing about CAG. I'm pretty sure they don't care about our third-party tools that much. Uh, so uh -huh. they were improving Planet Tech and the latest version of the, it's called Star Citizen Explorer, SC Explorer, a tool by Captain BA. Um, the latest version of the game files is not compatible with the most recent version of his tool, unfortunately, meaning that currently we can't extract the terrain data or the elevation data. However, if you have a copy of a game file from like half a year ago and the planetary terrain didn't change since then, you can still use the tool that is publicly available and create maps either from a smaller location, like a, a crop of a planet or the entire planet. And what the tool allows you to do is to get a high bit depth or high uh, color range maps in grayscale and the whiter the, the part of the map, the higher the elevation. And that way you can then reconstruct as a 3D maps or, or whatever you want. I have a slide later how that looks like with a link to the tool. So if you have a copy of an older game file, you're absolutely able to play around with that and extract height information, yes. That was an awesome, awesome. question. Nice. Uh, Skippy, at the end, if you could share that person's name with us again so we can look that up. That yes, I, I do have a, a slide with a link to the project somewhere in here. All right, so yeah, we get all locations and all static items. We get information about lakes. Even the shoreline of a lake is in the in the game file. It's pretty cool. The path of rivers leading to the lake with like the, uh, I'm pretty sure you've seen that in Inside Star Citizen, how they construct the, the rivers. They put points somewhere or the tool automatically puts points somewhere and there's water flowing between the points, trying to find a slope um, so the water can flow downwards, not upwards. And these points are in the game files as well, so we can reconstruct not only locations of rivers, but the absolute path of the water taken all the way to the to the lake. Um, and then there are also some properties of the planets and moons, including maps, including height elevation, uh, but also all, um, rotation speed, for example, is is in there. And yeah, with 
with all that in mind, uh, we started a new version of Verse Guide uh, that later started to implement these maps. And uh, you can see the shadows here uh, for the mountain ranges. This is extracted height information and then baked as a shadow map into this 2D map. So you can see some elevation doesn't give you like, like information of meters, but we try to visualize some mountain ranges there. Um, and that's what you use and see at the moment, uh, the, the verse guide we know. All locations in verse guide are data mined. They are not manually added to the database at this point. Um, and the other thing that and um, the other thing that was enabled by having a vast uh, database of different locations on planets is not only the OM navigation, which like uh, with my orange and the four sticks and the OMs and the tape, but I could do compass navigation. And for most locations, that is much, much faster to do. Let me quickly explain how that works. Um, here we go. New orange, only one axis. That's like the north and the south pole. And now we are dealing with um, a geographic coordinates, latitude, longitude, and altitude, if you want. And this time I don't start at an orbital marker in space because for some planets that's quite a long travel time. But I start at a known location on a planet, like over here. That's, I don't know, Lawville, for example. And now I want to go to an unknown cave no man has ever set foot in. So what is the fastest way to go from Lawville to this cave? The traditional way would be to go back in space, to go to an orbital marker and do the zigzag thingy all the way to the cave. But a better way would be to just point your ship into the direction of the cave and fly along the planetary surface and find this cave. So I would like to know I have a compass in my ship, so I can just point my ship in a certain direction at a certain angle and keep flying and keep that angle. That, however, is not the best way because, that's why this orange is here, I could draw a line from Lorville to this cave that keeps going east. So I'm flying east and east and east and east and east along a straight line, I assume, all the way to the cave. This is not the shortest way, and it's also not a straight line. Going east on a curved surface like a planet is not resulting in a straight line. It's an arc, and it's definitely not the shortest way. So what I want to do is to find the shortest way to between two points on a planetary surface. That would be a straight line. But this straight line is not now not going in the same compass direction. As you can see, here we go. I start heading almost directly north at the beginning, like north, northeast. And then I continue, continue, continue. And at some point, I'm going straight east. Ah, focus, straight east. And then when I'm close to the North Pole, I'm suddenly going south, 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 until I'm at the point. But this is the shortest way. And that makes it quite challenging to give you instructions how to find locations. Um, because either I give you a direction that you, that you keep, which would be east, 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 but then you have to fly a much longer way. Or I tell you, okay, I want you to point your ship at a certain angle, This, in this case, north, northeast, find a landmark on the horizon and keep going to that landmark. And once you're at that landmark, find the next landmark in the same direction on the horizon and keep going in this direction. Because I, I can't tell you, okay, for the first 10 meters go north, northeast, and then for the next 10 meters go northeast, and for the next go like southeast. That would, like, I don't know where you are when. So we are telling you point your ship at the horizon, at a surface, uh, at a landmark in the distance, and keep going towards this direction until you hit your point. If, that, if it's night 
or if it's completely dusty and rainy or, or foggy, then you can't do that because you can't see shit. Um, so in that case, you have to fly the long way around where we give you a, a compass heading that you have to keep. Uh, so important, if you use a short way, your compass heading will change over time. Do not try to correct it. Always go in a straight line towards the, the landmark in the distance. If, you give, if we give you a compass heading and tell you to keep the compass heading, correct the compass heading and always stay on the compass heading. But the spots in the distance will change because you're not going in a straight line. You're now flying a circle. That's compass heading navigation. Uh, back to the slides. So this would be the straight line. And on a 2D map, this straight line looks like this. Stupid 3D spherical geometry being pressed into 2D doesn't really work. So on, the, on our 2D maps, um, latitude and longitude and cardinal directions will be constant. But since a straight line will not keep your compass heading straight, you see that the compass heading changes while you go in a straight line. This is a straight line. This is not a curve. Um, okay, then Chica asked me to, to demo a few features. Let's do that. Uh, are we here? Yes, nice. I think most of you used Verse Guide before, which is very humbling to us. We didn't think that this project will turn out to be used by so many people, which is pretty cool. Um, if not, it's like you, you start on the homepage, uh, you have an about section about everyone who ever contributed to Verse Guide. Like it's a set long list of people by now. Um, you have a quick search feature where you can, I don't know, Lorville should give us locations in Lorville and direct links much easier to, to find, for example, if I don't know where Jumptown is which is me all the time. Um, on. Then I figure out, oh, jump on is on Daymar. Um, or I can rose the different system, like Stanton and Pyro at the moment. And I can go to, for example, Hurston. And all the locations I am presented with are locations that have quantum markers. We want to make sure that you only get spoilers if you're really sure you want to get spoilers. If I want to see all locations, not only those that have quantum markers, not only those that are publicly accessible, I can activate hidden locations. It gives me a warning. Yes, yes, please. I want to see all the hidden locations and I want to get all the spoilers. And suddenly you have a list of all the caves. All the hidden locations at the moment are rendered in black dots. All the official quantum marker locations are rendered in white. So not to spoil anyone here in the presentation, I will disable the hidden locations again. So I don't see any caves, for example. But I still have like salvage yards and cities and underground facilities and whatnot. I can enable and disable like filter locations and the list of locations down here updates in real time. I have a few cool uh, features that should help set up events, for example. Let's say I want to do an event on this fancy island, uh, HDMS Stanhope, but I want to do the event sometime early March, let's say on Saturday, because it's a weekend. Um, and let's use UTC time and I was thinking about doing the event at 5 a.m. UTC, but that's stupid because then it's dark at Stanhope. So let's see what would be the earliest time the sun is rising in Stanhope. Yeah, that's somewhere between 5.30 and 5.45 a.m. So if we maybe get in the lobby at 5.15, we are ready by 5.45 sunrise in Stanhope, and that's what I'm looking for. Perfect. So there's some uh, day, daylight and nighttime uh, prediction algorithm that was done by Just Murphy that we implemented. So we can not only tell you if it's daytime or nighttime right now at that location, but we can also tell you for any future date so you can plan events accordingly. If I hover over... Oh, to make it smaller. If I hover over any location on the top right corner, I'm not sure if that's visible, 
you will see information for that location about sunrise and sunset at Operai sunsets in seven minutes. It's a reclamation at the poser. Over here is a salvage yard. The sun rises in 45 minutes. So this is all real-time information at the moment. But I can also add a time offset. Okay, I want to know what the uh, conditions are in one hour and 60. Huh, that's an interesting way to put it. In one hour and 60 minutes, or also known as in two hours. <laughs> and you get adjusted for that. Or you can set a day in the future and get the same information up there. Ah, that's a cool side, side thing. Um, you also have a map of temperatures, and unfortunately for us, it's currently not easy to remove false entries. Someone sometimes someone gets the planet wrong, uh, and they enter the temperature for I don't know Daymar on Hurston, and suddenly you have a cold spot on Hurston at minus seven centigrade. That's not okay. Uh, <laughs> but we're working on on an easier way for us to. Um, edit this data and throw out bad data points. But overall, this, this map is pretty cool. And it's all community contributed, so people go there and report back to us what's the temperature and the map is uh, generated in real time. And I can also turn on map labels, so I see where I'm going. And we go to, to a certain location. I see pictures of that location. Uh, this is from Captain BA. It's a tool they create. So we have a rough outline auto-generated data mine from the game files, how this location looks like, but all the pictures here are community created. People went there, uploaded the pictures, so you have a preview of what you expect there. Then again, the weather data, people reporting the weather conditions, not only temperature, but also if it's windy or dusty, if the visibility was okay, and you get an indication at what time of the day this data was taken. So you see daytime and nighttime temperatures. You have some information about the type of location. Uh, I know it's an outpost, I know the name, currently has no description. It tells you what you can do there, refuel, repair, restock. And I can edit that. Like I can add a feature, like does it have a cargo deck? Can you get food there? Can you sleep there? Is there loot available? Um, or is there an armistice zone? So I can change this information here and save it. Add a description. And I can figure out how to get there. If this was a hidden cave that no one has seen before, how do we find it? And these are the two methods of navigation that I explained earlier. You have the OM navigation, which lets you fly to an orbital marker, the one closest to the location. And then it tells you step by step which direction to point your ship at, how far to fly, then to stop, then to turn your ship, fly in the other direction. And at some, some point, um, either fly straight down to the surface or fly uh, towards an OM and please stop before they hit the ground because you will hit the ground if you are on this flight path. Gives you the coordinates as well in latitude, longitude here. You have the altitude of this location. You have information about sunrise, sunset, um, uh, Cartesian coordinates and all orbital marker coordinates. That's all auto-generated from the routines and uh, APIs we have in the background. And then there are different methods how to use the OM uh, navigation. I would stick to Stoic Mako, which is one of our founders. Uh, I think his is almost the fastest, but definitely the easiest to follow. Uh, Pandabot, uh, one of the very, very early people who thought about this navigation uh, algorithms, has a slightly faster way to to do the like zigzag course to location, but it can be slightly more challenging to follow. So I would stick to Stoic. If you do compass heading, like I am at a location on a planet, you have to select where you are. This includes hidden location, like rivers and caves and shanty towns, but also like all of these strike through icon locations are hidden. But these ones, the location with a dot, these are quantum beacons, so I can also select a quantum beacon. This is all uh, ordered by distance. So if you scroll down to the first quantum beacon, you can be sure, okay, that's the closest quantum beacon to that location. So I can start here easily. And then the two different methods of uh, following a direction, one in a straight line, that would be initial bearing, most direct, fast route, straight line, but it requires a visible landmark that you have to see on the horizon. 
So the other one, constant bearing, is the curved longer way that allows you to follow your in-game, in-ship instruments, the compass. Uh, so it works in poor visibility and relies on instrument only. You can do that at night, but it will be slightly longer and a slightly longer way. And again, it gives you all the step-by-step -step directions. Point your ship in this direction and keep going. Yeah, I guess. That's, that's what you can do in Verse Guide right now. Uh, where is my slide? Here we go. That was a demo. Quick word about contributions to Verse Guide. All location details can be edited by everyone. Uh, the only requirement we have is that you need to create an account on Verse Guide. You can do that with your email address or with a Google login. Uh, we do not track email addresses. You will never see spam or emails from us. Uh, in fact, some of the automated email features like Email verification don't even work. They're broken for two years. We don't care. So you will not get emails, um, but we need to um, have the ability to track down accounts that spam the system because everyone who creates an account on VerseGuide is able to edit everything. You can rename locations. You can post your Viag Viagra commercials in the description of locations. And if we catch anyone who does that, we can just terminate the account and all the edits will be reverted to how it was before they spammed the system. So that's why there's an account requirement. Um, apart from that, nothing is locked down. You can change every single detail about a location the moment you have an account. Um, ah, the description here is completely off. Sorry for that. Um, everyone with an account can also upload pictures. And with a picture, we want you to tell us if the picture was taken at day, at night, at sunset, sunrise, and if it's a location overview or a detailed picture of some location inside a feature, like inside the cave, uh, for example. So we are collecting metadata for pictures. So at some point, if we have too many pictures for certain locations, we can separate them by the metadata in different groups. I just want to see outdoor pictures, indoor pictures. And then, as I mentioned already, weather. Um, everyone can submit weather reports, and we would like to gather as many weather reports as possible for the same location, so we can have an average temperature, a minimum temperature, a maximum temperature, um, and then also weather conditions. It's windy, it's dusty, but good visibility, which is weird. How can it be dust dusty, but the visibility is good? Anyways. Um, another way, obviously, that's a shameless plug to help us as Patreon. Um, we are hosting the entire website uh, as a Nux.js project on Google Firebase. We are a server-side rendered uh, website, and we have a back-end API on Node.js. The data is stored in a NoSQL database, which is called Firestore, and then all the images are hosted in cloud storage on Google as well. And the project cost is not that high. Currently, we are running $23 a month. That's still covered well, easy by, by the generous supporters we currently have on Patreon. So we are all good. It's only when we are stupid. Um, so that was me. Someday I changed something in an API function and I, I programmed a loop, an infinite loop. So the API was calling itself and calling itself and calling itself. And uh, the system we are on is scalable. So if not many people are using it, Google is reducing the resources. But when Google realizes, oh, there are 5 million people every second on the system, they're throwing in more servers and more servers and more servers. So the system is not slowing down, but it keeps going at the same pace. Sounds expensive. In this, in this case, this was horrible because I had a loop. And Google thought, oh, oh, more people, more people, more servers, more servers. So our costs skyrocketed within like the two hours until I notice what's going on. I got a warning from the credit card, like, oh no. <laughs> so that's why we need Patreon for, because sometimes we are stupid. We do these costly mistakes and don't realize that in time, unfortunately. Um, and then uh, kind of the biggest contributions we get are from other projects from the community. I love the collaborative spirit. Again, this is a, this is a, a member from Star Citizen who is doing SC Explorer, who was able to get the 
height information, reverse engineering planet tech, um, get the surface texture, get ocean shorelines very close to what you see in game. Again, you can't directly read out what's the elevation of every single point on the planet. You get these overarching maps that you have combine and merge and average and throw weird math and averaging in there. And then suddenly they were able to create maps that are insanely close to what you see in game, including height information. Um, so this project is available on Bitbucket, not the source code, uh, but the compiled files. And here you see the last uh, update was uh, mid-2023, and sometime in the end of 2023, uh, the current version broke with the latest game version. So if you have older versions from that time, you can still extract all the detailed height information from planets and surface texture coloring and everything. Really cool project. Um, and then, as I already mentioned, Murphy, or just Murphy, uh, who does amazing work with uh, offline maps. He has uh, navigation sheets. He has a uh, Google Sheet project that gives you all the sunrise and twilight times and whatnot. And Murphy contributed his math and explained how it works to us so we can um, implement it in our Node.js uh, backend. So that verse guide now is able to reproduce what Murphy invented in terms of sunrise and sunset times and predict that. And it's actually, hmm, do I have another orange? Yeah, huh. I have an orange without a stick. That's, oh no, I need a stick orange. Do I have a light? Light, 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 light. Here we go. Let me do that. That's actually a pretty cool, here we go. Pretty cool tidbit of information. Go on. No light. Light, light, light. Damn it, my light is empty. Do you have a phone? Yes. Ha, I can use my flashlight on my phone. Does it work? Yes. So that's the planet. That's the sun. If the camera would focus, here we go. So yeah. I'm illuminating one side of a planet and then you get sunrise and sunset easy enough but in reality you get summer and winter and summer and winter works like this the axis of earth is tilted towards the so orbit around the sun and then if i'm going half a year later the axis is tilted in the other direction so this would be summer on the northern hemisphere this would be winter on the northern hemisphere star citizen is faking this and this was, was super weird to me why they do that in the first place. All axes in Star Citizen are straight and planets are rotating. But they still have summer and winter, static summer and winter. The northern hemisphere of all the planets gets more light than the southern hemisphere. There's constant sunlight on the North Pole. And they do that by shifting the Stanton star above the orbit of the planets. So all the planets are in this... Um, this plane but the star is sitting millions of kilometers above it it's horrible <laughs> so that's how star citizen is doing summer and winter uh, so you can't use any of the math you use for our solar system to predict sunrise on mars for example that all exists but you have to reinvent sunrise and sunset prediction for this very unrealistic model of a solar system where the sun is just sitting somewhere above the ecliptic um so that was that was interesting that's what what Murphy did, found out and Murphy did and shared with us so we could implement it in Verse Guide, so which is very cool. But he also has uh, more tools uh, on a website from Data Consulting. If you're interested, it's a Murphy Exploration Group. We can find static maps and interactive Google spreadsheets to do all of this as well without the need for websites. This works offline. Future, bleak future of Verse Guide. Um, we are in need of Verse Guide 2.0, and this is not a decision we made voluntarily. Unfortunately, the host we chose, Google, which may have been a big mistake, um, is shutting down support for Node.js 16 in the next few months. Our website is currently running on Node 16. It's a JavaScript uh, framework version. Next 2, that 
we're currently using. It's a JavaScript framework that does all the fancy like transitions and single page server side rendered stuff. It's all very technical. But uh, the framework we're using is not supporting Node 18, so which would be the next version. There's no 17. It's not long time long term stable. So we would have to switch to Node 18 if we want to keep being hosted on Google. But Nux 2, which we're currently using, is not supporting uh, Node 18. So for the current version of Worst Guide, we have no upgrade path. It's basically impossible to switch to a different host because the uh, database we are using, this Firestore, um, is proprietary. Only Google is offering that, so we have to stay there as we have to reprogram the entire website. But if we want to stay there and still post updates to Worst Guide, we have to switch from Nux 2 to Nux 3. Uh, which is very, very different. You can't just upgrade the version. You have to basically start from scratch with Nux 3, and this will be fun. We will have the opportunity to change a lot of the, the user interface based on feedback we got to make it more user-friendly, but it will be immense work, and I'm not sure if we have enough manpower to do that and how long this will take. So it could be that at the moment Google decides to drop support for Node 16, there could be a year maybe even more where we are unable to post any updates to worst guide which would be a shame doesn't well, mean I that here i know you can't read chat but i think you're getting volunteers that could help with that migration from from the org uh, and you know some of the volts just raised his hand please make sure to copy the chat and forward it to me because i can't see it so thank you for that that would be amazing to to get help with migration and switching to to nux3 that would be cool um so if google drops support it doesn't mean that it won't execute the current website anymore that will still work um and we can still upload updates to to locations that's all in the framework we don't have to compile it offline but it does mean that we can't add features we can't fix bugs in the current version anymore we'll be stuck at the version it's at um but we can still upload location information. You can still edit stuff um, until we, we switch to Nux3 or switch to a completely different provider that doesn't do this bullshit. Um, another challenge is a new MobiGlass, and that's something we really want to wait for. How many of the features you currently have in Verse Guide will be implemented in MobiGlass? We hope all of them. Um, if locations and maps become a commodity that had that has value that you want to sell, that you get credits for. Um, Worst Guide does not want to conflict with gameplay. If we are giving you information that has value in game in terms of I want to sell this information in game, we will remove this information from Worst Guide because it would hinder gameplay. Um, and then if, if the MobiGlass features include custom location markers and direct navigation and whatnot, we don't need the navigation on Worst Guide anymore if you can do that in MobiGlass directly. So a future of, of Worst Guide could be much, much simpler than the current version because many of the features are in-game. That would be ideal. Um, or maybe Worst Guide is completely obsolete altogether and we just shut it down and we would be happy to do so. It, it's great to stay in-game and do all that that Worst Guide is currently doing. So um, that's why we haven't started with the migration yet because it could be that we are just shutting it down in a half year. Maybe. It should be one of our leaders popped in and fixed your permissions that we can fix for you you should oh. be able to view chat now view the chat a little late but open chat i'll see the chat now no i don't i can open the chat but it says messages failed to load okay well we'll figure that out before next i'll be yeah, um... there <laughs> All right, and the, the final challenge is server-side POIs, points of interest. So, as I said, the coffee coffee cups that I'm dropping in the forest is not in the game files. That is streamed from the server to the client, to all the clients. And I don't see a reason why CRG couldn't do that for all the locations. For example, all locations on Hurston, every single one, the location, well, the location information where you find a cave and an outpost and whatnot are all in a two megabyte file in the game files. This doesn't need to be in the game files. The server could just give it to the client on demand when I get close to Hurston. And if it's not in the game files anymore, they could uh, encrypt it 
so you can't intercept it and then there would be no way to data mine it anymore without like really breaking terms of service and we wouldn't want to do that so we are hoping that at some point CAG will not serve every location on a platter anymore and this will make exploration way more fun and then when I find this cave by accident or because I really put effort into finding locations, this location will hold immense value. And then I can sell a map in game with that location. It would be awesome. I would love that gameplay. And we won't spoil these locations that are so rare and so valuable on game uh, on, on Verse Guide anymore. So we might have a crowdsourced location data base for benign locations. Like this is the coolest mountain on Hurston go see it and that doesn't hold much value so there could be a verse guide like that and picture contest share your most beautiful picture of that mountain but we won't host any valuable locations anymore if it like counters gameplay i think that was it yes if there are questions i still can't see chat so chica has to read your questions or you need to talk to me or uh, send me a text message later but here's Q &A some part. Uh, I'd love to have people raise their hands so they can ask you the questions verbally if you're okay with that, Skippy. Yes, please. Yes, please. And I please already shy, have folks. a few examples. If you can't think think of a question, so just pick one. All right, we have Sleeper Actual coming up to the stage with a question. Sleeper, you should be able to speak now. Sleeper, if you're speaking, you might be muted. Hardware. Oh, there you go. We good? Hi. Hey, uh, I just want to say hey, thanks for for coming and sharing this all with us and uh, and breaking it down Barney style. <laughs> nice. Thank you. <laughs> all right. So it was a beer can. Store, you should be able to speak. Um, I like to add my thanks to, and we met briefly before, but, uh, is there an ideal altitude above a location when you're getting OM distances? As close to the location as possible, as close to the ground as possible. Okay. The closer you. you are to the ground, the more accurate your location will be. Um, and verse guide itself will make sure that we don't give you instructions that will crash you into the ground. The instructions on verse guide will warn you, okay, if you continue on that path, please stop at this distance. Because if you keep on going, you will crash. So we map uh, so the flight instructions are always in a way that we minimize the risk of crashing. Because that's uh, the risk when you measure OM distances very close to the ground. It will bring you to that location that close to the ground. And if you're just like 10 meters off, you will hit the ground. Um, but the algorithm in the back end, we make sure that we give you instructions that minimize this risk. So always go close to the ground, measure OM distances. And currently, we don't even have a feature online where you can input your OM distances manually to get instructions. But that's the next thing we are working on. So you can. Uh, at least offline store OM distances to certain locations and then use verse guide inputs these locations and get instructions. Okay, thank you. Lord, Lord Scooby, I'm told if you close and reopen chat, fix the okay. real this time. Uh, and I'm going to invite up uh, Fulu to the stage here. Mm. I might have to. No, it still says fail to open try again. Yes, it works. Hello. <laughs> Hulu, you should have uh, an open mic now. Yeah, there we go. Helps when I wear my mic too, I suppose. Um, yeah, so you mentioned uh, Nuxt and of course Node.js. Um, what other challenges have you had from the tech side of, of building out this website, um, maybe ones you've overcome, maybe some that have shifted your direction, at least, you know, or priority of the website. Well, what other challenges come to mind? Biggest challenge we're still working on is search. We chose Google Firebase because it's scalable. It's basically free if no one uses the site, that's cool. Like if the project is complete failure, we don't have to keep paying $50 a month for a server. 
but if the project becomes massively popular, uh, the the service scales with the demand, which is nice. Um, that was the reason we chose that environment. And then we thought it's Google. It's a product by Google. It must have a great database with great search functionality. No. Google Firestore, the database we're using, which is part of Firebase, does not have any search capability, which is the biggest bullshit I've ever seen from Google. So it is insanely hard for us to have an interface where you can filter locations by properties, for example. Show me all caves at a distance in this radius or show me all locations that have a trade terminal or something like that. Just doesn't work. The way we currently implement the search feature on Versguide, like you can type in a partial name of a location like Lorf and it will show you Lorville. The way we are doing that at the moment and Google forces us to do it is we build an array of all partial names of a location. So for Lorville, you will have L O R and O R V and L O R V and O R and so on. Like all different snippets of Lorville of the name in different lengths are in this array for this one location. And then the only search we can do is like try to find a match to what you typed, like Lorf, with a location that has this partial string in it. Stupid as fuck. Sorry. Um, so there are third-party solutions, how to fix search in Firebase and Firestore, but they're all commercial and they all cost money, and uh, we are afraid this will be above our current budget. Um, that's a Patreon thing in the end, but also uh, we don't have the manpower to implement a third-party search tool at the moment. It's a different API, the databases need to be synchronized between the third-party search tool and Firebase. And initially our hope was like, it's Google. Google bought Firebase from a different vendor. Uh, they will fix it. They will put search in it, right? It's like, that's what Google does. But no, so far, three years, four years and counting, no search in the database, biggest challenge at the moment. Thank you. Sorry, I've been speaking to you with the muted mic. Uh, yeah, Paul, <laughs> I was waiting to see if anyone else wanted to speak up. Um, I did have a question for you. You mentioned the future ability to put in like the coolest mountain, essentially to create POIs that aren't official POIs. Yeah. Um, how soon is that on the horizon? Are you waiting for the new version of Verse Guide, or is that something we might see relatively soon? Mm. It's something we would like to get in before Google shuts down support for updates. Um, we revamped the planet and moon overview page in the last update with a map. Oh, that's something I didn't show. I should do that. Wait. Where's uh, guide? Share the other screen. No, oh, that's me already. Nice. Um, if you go to the overview of a planet, we now have a 3D globe. I'm very, we are very proud of that. So not only is this full of 3D and the shadow of the mountain changes based on the direction of the sunlight, it's a subtle effect, but it gives you a 3D view of the planet. And then you can zoom in really, you can see all the shorelines, it's really cool. So that was the last update we did, basically revamping this website, uh, this, this page of the website. Um, our next planned update would be for this page. So the detailed location overview, we want to do the pictures a little bit larger. We want to finally fix this map. Um, we want to make the selection between different mapping uh, navigation methods easier. Most likely we will remove the original the Panderbot method and make it a little bit easier to switch between the, the two compass bearings. Make people easier understand what the differences are. It's this, this weird weather bug out where people sometimes report wrong weather, wrong wrong images. Um, and together with this, we would like to have a, a version, uh, basically, you would have a tile here that says add new location. And then you click on it and you get a blank, blank slate where you can input the coordinates of this location and our goal is that you can select somewhere here 
with whom you want to share this location. Because when you have an account, our website knows what main org you're associated with. So we could have a drop down menu, share this location with everyone, or share it only with me privately. No one else is allowed to see it, but it should be in my private collection of cool locations, or share it with everyone who's in the same org as I am. So you can have like a org database of cool locations that everyone from your org is seeing. So that's our, our goal. We hope we get that in before Google shuts down, update a I bit. Someone uh, answers questions, questions you haven't asked yet. That's the best. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so this page is our next big focus to make that nicer and less bug free and add features. And if you report a custom location that you don't want to share, just store for yourself, you would also get navigation instructions to this location you want to go back to. That would be a nice feature. Yeah, so be amazing. That's, that's, would, be, uh, would be cool, absolutely. One more question for me, and this one is kind of, uh, might be kind of goofy, but comparing, we were working on a document to teach people how to use maps in Star Citizen. And one of the things I noticed when the two main sources we use for, for this kind of data is VersGuide or the Murphy's exploration materials. Mm -hmm. I noticed you each chose a different Meridian using an OM marker, the Meridian. Yes. Is there a reason for your choice of Meridian? Yeah. Um, it started with the maps. We tried to align Meridians with what CAG is doing in the game files. Um, and CAG is not telling us what the internal Meridian is for OM1 or OM2 or whatnot. Um, wait, I need to go back to this. Uh, So when Captain BA was able to recreate these maps, they realized that the beginning of the in-game in-game file map is here at this edge, which is I'm not even sure what OM is floating above that. Uh, we removed that because it's in the end it's not that interesting, but there might be a way to get it. Uh, we would love to see that I'm again, but I, I figured it out yeah. the other day for our document, but I don't remember off the top of my head. I know it's one okay. off of Murphy's, it's 90 degrees different. Okay, we we should be able to to get a button in here, show OM markers, or maybe up there, and then the OMs would pop up as well. Um, might be nice. Uh, so it seems like the game files put the zero meridian up here, wherever that OM is. And that's when we decided to change OM or Meridian locations um, for all tools that participated. And Murphy has so much to do with day jobs that he was unable to update that yet in his maps. Um, it might be coming. We might be shifting back as well, uh, depending on what CIG is doing. And again, if the new star map does all this, we are just shutting it down, don't care about it anymore. Lord Skippy, we do have a question from the audience that's by text. Um, mm -hmm. It's, do you know if CIG is aware of Verse Guide? And if so, do we know their thoughts on it? Oh, Am I oh yes. We, we do, we do. Um, we created an overlay once um, that was before Easy Anti-Cheat, and we chose a method to implement this overlay directly with um, DirectX. So we injected graphics into the game engine directly, which was possible back then. It was super cool because it was always also working in full screen, not only on borderless windowed, which is, has performance implications. So it was pretty fast, pretty cool. And easy anti-cheat got rid of this uh, possibility, unfortunately. So we never continued down this path. But we wanted to know if us injecting information into the game stream into DirectX directly is something that would be a violation of the terms of service with CIG. So we contacted them. We contacted CIG's legal department We're like here, that's an open source project. That's the source code. We would like to, to keep working on that and offer that to the community. What are your thoughts? Do you want to officially endorse us and work together with us and make it cooler and look, look more like Star Citizen? Or do you want us to shut it down? Their response was hmm, very diplomatic. They were like, we are not officially allowed to give you permission to do that. But they didn't say, stop what you're doing. So we kept doing what we were doing, but it was clear at that point. Um, their main reason was open source. Um, 
because it is extremely hard for a company to control open source projects because everyone can just copy the source code, make it their own. So they were very reluctant to officially endorse an open source project doing that, but they did not tell us to shut it down. So we consider that as a, as a win for us. But then Easy and to Cheat got, got rid of the possibility, unfortunately. And we, we do have a, uh, a young man in our org that's been working on an overlay similar to what you described. Mm -hmm. um, his does work uh, with the current version of the game, so I'd love to introduce you to him. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to join us this morning. That would be nice, yeah. There are ways to do overlays, um, but not with DirectX injection anymore. Uh, so you could have a transparent window that lays on top of the game. Uh, doesn't work with full screen, uh, only with borderless windowed, but that is that is fine. So would be would be nice to have that in game. But again, if Mobi Glass is implementing all these features, there's no need for this kind of overlay. So we are waiting yearly for the next version and see what the actual star map looks like. One of the things that's been suggested within like our initiative group, which is our exploration group is the possibility that we may want tools outside of the game to find places. So if we hide something, there's no risk of someone being able to steal that from us in some future version of the game uh, via data running or some other thing. There may be a benefit okay. to keeping that information outside of the game. Uh, does I anyone see. have any other okay. questions for Lord Skippy? Uh, we're coming up on, or I think just past our hour by about 15 minutes. Uh, we have a question from Bonsai. Bonsai, I'm inviting you up to speak. Hey, um, <clears throat> all those filthy monkeys really appreciate what you guys are doing. And uh, is there a way I could use some of this technology for my flat Hurston project? What is that project doing? We're trying to prove that the universe is flat. Okay. Um, huh. No. <laughs> I just wanted to I, I think what you know I, I think there there was a post by by CAG that they are about to update the planet tech to version 4.0 or something and finally introduce introduce realistic flat planets I can look up the link Thank you Bonza <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have a, another question from uh, Elfie we're inviting Elfie up to speak Hello, can you hear me? Hi, yes. Nice, very good. Um, I was gonna just gonna jump on that that quick um overlay train and be like, would you be would you guys be interested in collaborating with other uh projects that are pre existing regarding overlays to like mix and match a bit? Or yes. You... Um... Okay, yeah. Perfect. So there are, there are a few overlays that are currently already working and provide some some information like anti-piracy overlays, for example, super useful. Um, our main blocker at the moment is to make the API completely open and accessible, which is something we would have to do at this stage if we want to allow third-party tools to use the data of Worst Guide and implement it. Um, the alternative would be to implement API keys and rate limits and quotas and whatnot so that people from outside the project who do a mistake and create a infinite loop don't cost us $500 a night. Um, so that's yeah. a big blocker yeah. at the moment. <laughs> um, unfortunately, we have to pay for every single API request. If someone is trying to get data from the database through the API, it costs us 0 0.1 cents, which is nothing, which is all good. Again, we currently have to pay like $20 a month, which is easy to, to cover. But mm -hmm. if we allow third-party programmers to do their own code and openly use our API without any rate limits, and we don't have any of this technology in place at the moment, it would be too risky to allow them to, to do that. So yeah, That's we have to find a way to, <laughs> to rate limit and quota the API with API keys. And then yes, yes, please use the data and do whatever you want with it because the community is amazing and they do amazing tools. Yeah, it's gonna come back to you regarding that some some, some later time. Fine. Cool, yes, please. Okay, in that case, thank you. Thank you very much for the- Thank you. For the, for the seminar. Does anyone else have any questions before we end the seminar for today?
Klaus finished typing here. Uh, in the meantime, uh, Lord Skippy, thank you so much for joining us for this. This was our first time trying to do one of these. Uh, I hope that it's something we could do uh, regularly. I'm trying to get something like this going quarterly with a cool topic for the org. Um, you were an awesome uh, first impression. I don't think too many other people would have went out to buy fruit right before the uh, presentation. Uh, <laughs> At least I, I found fruit attacks. I like. At first, I only found grapefruit, which I hate, so I was lucky to find big oranges. Yeah, I'm not sure if you could read back in chat from before you got chat access, but they're all making fun of you for being from Florida and buying an orange for the demonstration. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Thank you so much for, for having me. Amazing to see so much interest and so many great questions. And yeah, if, if you have any questions that come to mind later, let me know. DM me, DM Cheeker. Get in contact via, I don't know, x.com also. Uh, H2O did have a question. Uh, is Verscat officially uh, backed by any major org? Mm, we try to avoid that. Uh, we are glad that our current org, like all of us from our our founder team, are at the Garden Interstellar Initiative at the moment, and we are glad that they allow us to use it and pitch it and do events that like collect data for worse guides. That is cool, but we don't want to be the tool by org X anymore because we had this very bad experience with Nova Intergalactic mm -hmm. at the beginning. Um, over the time, uh, basically all orgs we were part of, there was um, Deep Space Crew and Cornerstone, two amazing orgs. They were all very happy to collaborate with Verse Guide, but we never wanted to make it Verse Guide by Deep Space Crew, for example. It's a standalone project with so many people working on it that are part of different orgs, so it's always like it's an org from the community as a whole to the community. We don't care if it's used by pirates or by non-pirates. If there's an opportunity for other orgs to participate the way you said you were letting GII, uh, I think we would definitely be interested in helping collect data for. Uh, yeah, um, we we do have a Discord somewhere. Where was it? Here, ha! I have a slide for that. Um, we have a Discord for Verse Guide. Um, whenever there's a new version, for example, every now and then we have to delete all the pictures that were, were ever submitted to Verse Guide, and suddenly everything looks very boring and stupid. And then there will be a call, please, here, we need pictures of every single location. And that would be amazing if, if orcs would jump onto this challenge, create events to collect pictures or temperature data, weather reports or whatever. Um, or or um, Sometimes CAG has objects, locations in the game files that are invisible. For example, currently in the game files, there's already the uh, distribution centers. We know the locations of the distribution centers as they were tested by CAG in the current version of the game. But when you go there, nothing is there because they made the object containers invisible. The location is there, but nothing exists at the location. So when we have an update like that, we will post on the Discord here, check out these locations, tell us if there's anything there or not, because we can't go to 50 locations within an hour. Uh, <clears throat> and then we can hide these locations on Verse Guide because they are currently blank. There's another Discord uh, from the Meridian Exploration Group that is a more general Discord that brings everyone who's interested in mapping and pathfinding and creating uh, surface textures and whatnot together. So all the tools are on there that are doing something with mapping and location finding. Um, so it's not only Verse Guide uh, that needs help, but many other tools as well to test bugs and find new locations and whatnot. So if you're interested in dedicated events around that, uh, always worth so a look to, to check Meridian as well. Probably one of our last speakers here that for, since we're over time. Uh, we've just called up John McKeel to the stage. John McKeel is one of our exploration leaders in the org. And he had a question for you, Lord Skip. Hi. Hey, Sk Hey, Lloyd Scapey, thanks so much for uh, coming and doing this. Really, really appreciate it. Um, just super, super quick, uh, just uh, with the inquisitive mind that I have, and I know I can fly outside the uh, object container going to the edge of the map a little bit, is the Stanton system, if you looked at it as a circle, is it uh, as tall as it is wide? Can we fly Ooh. up or down as far as we can? fly out as far as the star or is it more of like oval 
oval or if it's pancake shape, then we've got trouble because then we got these flat earth uh, Hurston guys over here <laughs> nice. going nuts with I... it. But do you have any kind of answer for that? I do not think that there is any issue with flying outside of object containers. Um, you will just be in empty space. I don't think there's an object container with a certain dimension that encompasses the entire stand system. There's an object container for Hurston and its moons and so on and so forth. But how far you can travel within a solar system should only depend on the coordinate system engine in the background, which is a 64-bit coordinate system, which is something that's not common to, to games and that was implemented by CHG to allow for exactly that. So I don't see any issue with just flying straight up out of the plane of the solar system and keep going at some point. I'm pretty sure we will, you will create a 30k, but this will be like after years of traveling straight line. That's amazing. So the universe is bigger than I thought. Thank you. All right, with that, I think uh, we will end this event. Lloyd Skippy, thank you again so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Absolute pleasure, and thank you for letting us record it for the org mates that weren't able to make it. Um, I'm going to shut down the event here. If anyone has any questions, feel free to PM uh, Lloyd Skippy, and if you can't find him, awesome. PM me, and I'll put you in touch with him. Awesome. Cheers. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you.